Real pleasure to be back here. Uh, happy memories in DCU. There's a lot of faces there. There's a lot of stories and crack. Uh, it's great to be back on World Mental Health Day. Uh, it's great to be here to see the Recovery College started. It has been talked about for a long time over the years, Liam, different things and ideas. But it's great that it's here. But I, I suppose I'm going to talk about recovery probably in a different sense than Barbara, in the sense that Barbara's story is so strong and so proud that the human resilience of people that become a victim, a victim of a diagnosis, a victim of a system and an idea that prescribes somebody that has emotional trauma as having some sort of a disease. I don't believe that. I have no understanding of where that comes from. But what I do believe is the vigilance and the bravery of people that can take something so traumatic in their lives and turn it around and change it into being themselves, bringing out themselves, moving and developing and becoming whole again. It's the bravery of those people. And I've met countless hundreds of thousands of them over the last 30 years. 30 years ago, I spent time in psychiatric hospital a long time, diagnosed with an illness called Paranoid schizophrenia. What it is, I have no idea. Do I believe it exists? Absolutely not. Do I believe that people have it? No. But what I do believe in is recovery. But I don't believe in it in the sense of where it has started in some places to try and develop, where it has been captured and held by certain, or certain types of beings and people and organizations. The history of recovery is very simple. Some people mightn't like it, but it's a fact, and we need to understand the history of it so that we can try and progress it, so that we can try and move this movement on, and so that we can start to open the whole field around how we provide mental health services. What are the concepts of them? What are they about? Anybody any idea where the whole idea of recovery come from? Liam mentioned it earlier on. No. Within the mental health context that come from a group of survivors who were sitting talking 38 years ago around why are we diagnosed, why are we given labels, why does our lives come to an end, why do we become institutionalized, why do we spend our lives medicated. And they, had, they knew instinctively there had to be another way. There had to be another way of doing things, but hadn't found any way of getting to it. And they start to talk about this thing and somebody come up with the word recovery. And really all recovery was in those days. It has developed and it's great to see where it is now that there's a recovery college. But in those days it was very simple. It was two fingers up to the system. We're not going to be mental patients. We're not going to accept your labels. And we're not going to be defined by the books that you define us by. That's what it was. But how it has grown how it has taken a life of its own, how it has developed, and how it has bred strength across the world is amazing. Totally amazing. I was diagnosed with schizophrenia because I hear voices. Still hear voices. Well, not as often as they've kind of went on a holiday, they've left for a while, they might come back and they might not. But this definition, because I heard four voices, I was given a definition of schizophrenia. And I bought that label because it was a man in a white coat nice collar and tie on him and a suit on him and he told me you're schizophrenic. I had no idea what a schizophrenic was but like Barbara I learned to be one but I learned to be the bloody best one in the hospital. <laughs> so, uh, so it's a learned behavior. We become, we become what that diagnosis has given to us because it becomes the only identity that we have. Your human identity is stripped from you and you're landed with this whole new label and a set of values and a set of beliefs that are there before us. What are people supposed to do? Only learn from them. And the tragedy is, like Barbara and others, I taught a lot of other people to be good schizophrenics in the early days. And then I spent 30 years trying to tell people, no, we don't, it doesn't exist. We need to get back to ourselves again. That might be schizophrenia in itself. That might be madness in itself. But that's what it is. But the reality of this is, is that recovery has become something. It's breathing and it's living. I think actually we've moved beyond it, but we'll stick with it at the minute. 
I think we need to start, to, you know, we have services that we're developing and trying to develop services. And I worked along with a lot of people sitting in this room over a long number of years. Catherine, Ned, Ethna, I can go right around, Jerry Moore, they're all there. There's a lot of people over the years to try and think about how we could do this differently. And we've started to go down that road of doing the thing differently. But we still need to ask questions. There's some things we need to question. And I'm going to throw a spanner in the works now. Like we talk about, for our sake, psychiatric nursing in one field. And then over here we talk about mental health nursing. There's also almost, almost like a schizophrenia in that. What are we talking about? As the psychiatric nurse or mental health nurse? I think we need to get rid of the language of madness. That's our biggest problem. Language. When we use this type of language that separates us from the people that we're with, that becomes a major problem. So we need to get away from all that. We need to get back to the fact that I'm Paddy McGowan and Liam McGowan sitting over there and Mary Farley sitting there. We're people. We're people. We're not parts of a product or an industry. We're people. And I have this thing about keeping things simple. Bring it back to the basics. If someone's in distress, we try to help them through the distress. We try to be there for them. Sometimes the simplest thing is just to sit with somebody without doing anything. The cup of tea or whatever it is. So I think we, this recovery college in places like this is an evolution to try and get us back to there. Back to those basics. And forget about the science. I talk about the Zanussi effect. Anybody remember the ad that used to be on the, on the television years ago for the Zanussi appliances? Anybody know the tagline? Science. Science. Exactly, Liam. The appliance of science is what has caused all of the problems that we're in at the minute. Because this isn't about science. This is about a human journey. And that human journey at times can float along lovely for people. And for other people it can become a total fuck up. It'll just wreck them. Including myself. And all the science in the world didn't help me to find my way out of it. What helped me to find my way out of it was a human being that forgot about labels, identities, or anything else. That's what we need to get to. Back to that humanity. And forget about trying to make this complicated. Because it doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs us, all of us, to concentrate on each other. On what it is that's in our lives and what's around our lives. So it is. But we have moved. 30 years ago, when I left hospital and come out and seen the way things were, good people. Every one of the people that worked with me in the hospital were good people. But they were as institutionalized as I was. Totally caught in a world that was not for real for them either. So we decided we were going to try and do something. And we, almost 20 years ago, set up the Irish Advocacy Network. Uh, 220 what were called mental patients or service users, I happen to call them people, come together in Derry to form. To have, well, essentially what it was originally was 220 as it was classified by some people, nutters heading to have a party. And Derry. But out of that party, out of that party, party come an Irish identity about resistance, about revolution, about taking back. You know, people were telling us, we'll empower you. We'll, we'll empower you. Follow us, we'll empower you. Bullshit. Nobody empowers anybody. You take power. And that's what recovery is about. Taking back your own power. And Barbara talked about it so eloquently, about taking that power back. And that's what that movement was about 30 years, all 20 years ago. And between then and now where we're at, the amount of people and things that are happening around the country, the amount of developments that are coming, the amount of things that are driven by survivors, service users, or whatever you want to call them, is unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable for a country of our size. The amount of developments and things that have happened, and that have happened in collaboration, Sometimes by ourselves, but mostly in collaboration. And that's what recovery is about. The next 30 years, 
if we're about to see it. I don't think I will be, but if we're about to see it, there'll be huge differences. But we need to get we need to get back to a place of starting and keeping our focus on what recovery is really about. What recovery means in everybody's lives. So it's not not about the you know, uh, I have a certain angst at the minute that psychiatry, doctors, not nurses or anything, but doctors have sort of latched onto this idea of recovery. Oh, we'll do recovery oriented practice. But they haven't changed, they're still doing the same stuff. They're still doing the prescribing, they're still doing the diagnosing and all that, but that hasn't changed. We have to get that mentality changed. We have to actually get people to start thinking about doing that job in a different way as well. But that takes us all to do that. And that takes courage to do that. It's not the easiest way to work, but it's the only way to work. And that's what we have to do. That's what we have to do. The amount of people that we have lost along the way over those years, some of the people that were about in the very early days that aren't here today because they paid the price in many different ways for taking on this, this task, for taking on this piece of a revolution, or taking on the, the need to bring about change. I want to salute them, because we're standing on their shoulders. All of the things that are happening are because they put their, their back to the wheel. All of this comes from their hard, dedicated work over those years. I can name a lot of them, Kieran Crow for one, a number of other people. I'm not getting into it. There's too many of them. There's too many of them there. But we, we can't forget them. We can't forget them. This, this whole revolution or evolution, whatever way you want to describe it, would not have happened without those people. I remember actually 29 years ago, the first conference I ever spoke at in Belfast. I spoke about advocacy. Something that happens now that we take for granted. Very simple thing that we take for granted that somebody in the hospital will have a peer advocate. The first conference I ever spoke at, I was detained and brought into hospital. <laughs> eh? Three fucking days in the hospital. <laughs> I wasn't much of an advocate that I couldn't get myself out, but three days. Yeah. That's, you know, we can, I can laugh at that now. I can think about that now. 29 years ago, that's all we're talking about. You know, now it's part of what we do every day. You know, it's part of what we think about. So what I'm saying to you and what I'm trying to get you to think about is 29 years from now, where will we be? What's possible in those 29 years? What's possible in my head is that we will no longer have large or money-sized hospitals. That that area will have moved and it will have started to develop <coughs> community residences that are driven and work with psychiatric professionals and survivors together. That that whole idea of an institution will be gone. That a community house will be the norm. That's how we'll be with people. We'll not see them as people that need special treatment or special places that will actually look at it and say, these are our people, and we'll have them, and we'll be together in places of safety, but that are small within our own communities that aren't isolated. And that legacy will have to change, and that history will have to change. But we have to change it, and we have to be not afraid, we have to be not afraid to move to that change. And I have, I'm also hopeful within that period of time that the whole idea of diagnosing someone and sticking a label of mental illness on them will go. And it'll go because I don't believe there's any science behind it. It's an easy way of classifying people. But the, what does it tell us? You know, what does it tell us about somebody just because they hear voices, you give them a diagnosis of schizophrenia? The Native Americans, the Native Americans look at things differently. They don't trust anybody that doesn't hear voices. So over there, and that culture, and that culture, those that don't hear voices will be the ones locked up. I, I, I. So you know, we have to start. All of these things, all of these things are achievable. All of them are achievable. 
but you want to have to, you want to believe that they can be achieved. I want to see in time to come that recovery isn't even a word we talk about. We shouldn't, we shouldn't even have to be using that language either. We need to move to that place. We have to get to that place because we're talking about human beings. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about our family members, our next door, next door neighbors, and people around us that had a trauma in their life, as we all do. But for some of us, that trauma leads us in a direction, and a direction that can change the rest of their lives. For some people even yet that get these diagnoses and these labels, very simple things, getting insurance, getting a flight to America, get on a plane going to America if you have a diagnosis or if you've been detained within a hospital. It's a very simple thing, the green card, filling it out in the back of the plane, can deny access. I've been stopped, turned back because of it. Those things, basic human rights is again that we have to get overturned. These are the challenges that we still have to give. We can't hide behind them. We can't sort of think they're there, but we have to fight those. Those should not apply to anyone. Least, and at the very least, people that have been given a diagnosis should not have those restrictions. People with mental health difficulties should have exactly the same rights as every other citizen. There is no justification for it. But these are all things to do with recovery. Because for me, it's the recovery of a memory, of a history, of institutionalization, and society's way of looking at someone who is deemed different. That's the recovery we have to get into. Not the personal recovery of people, but there's a societal recovery there too. That has to be understood and challenged and not hid from. This whole idea of stigma, where does that come from? It comes from that history. It doesn't come from us. That was launched onto us. But it shouldn't be there. But it's there because of our history. It's there because of our belief systems. It's there because of what we were taught. And it's wrong. So the recovery that I want to see is a recovery of society as opposed to the recovery of the person. Then we'll have moved. Then we will really have moved. But I would like to wish the Recovery College the best in the future. And I know it will be a huge help to a lot of people because once you start to educate yourself on these things, on mental health and different ways, that's, that's when you recover. Thank you for listening.